Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. My name is Richard Dovenden. I am a Bordes Librarian and Head of Gardens, Libraries and Museums here at the University of Oxford. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to uh, this event here at the Bodleian Library this evening. Um, we've called this event The Gift of Translation. Uh, and it was originally planned to be delivered as part of the Bodleian Library's contribution to the 2022 Financial Times Literary Festival, which, um, uh, but owing to circumstances, as they say, beyond our control <laughs> back in March, we were unable to uh, hold it then, and we're very happy um, to have it, um, have it, have it rerun, as it were, this evening. The event is in celebration of the gift of uh, now actually more than a thousand books very generously donated to the Bodleian Libraries by Ian McEwan. This occasion gives me the chance to say a huge thank you to Ian for um, this wonderful gift and to do so in public. Um, as you may have noticed, we rather like books in the yeah. Bodleian. And, uh, and before I forget please come and join us in Blackwell Hall immediately after this event for a celebratory tincture to, um, to mark this wonderful occasion. And in fact, Ian this evening has brought even more books um, <laughs> with him, um, including uh, the, uh, the Arabic, uh, uh, an Arabic translation and Sp Spanish and Catalan uh, translations as well. So um, we're very happy to add those Although my colleagues in Rare Books who've been cataloguing them will have some more work to do, but that's the kind of thing we like doing here. Ian, of course, really needs no introduction to uh, uh, this audience, uh, to an audience indeed in this city where he lived and wrote for many years. Um, he is the author of 15 novels with the 16th lessons um, we were hearing about just before um, this event to appear later this year and um, one which we eagerly await because Ian wrote it during, uh, during lockdown. But his literary work stretches across uh, almost every other literary genre from children's fiction to essays, short stories, plays and even oratorio. His novels have been adapted for the screen near fewer than 11 times by my reckoning and he has received almost every literary accolade going. And, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I conjecture that he must have one of the longest mantelpieces <laughs> in Britain in order to cope with the range of awards he has received, um, which uh, stretch from the Booker Prize for Amsterdam, the Goethe Medal, and fellowships for the Royal Society of Arts, the Royal Society of Literature, the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And he was awarded the CBE in the New Year's Honours for 2000. And of course, in 2016, he received the Bodley Medal just across the road in the Sheldonian Theatre as part of the Bodleian's contribution to the Literary Festival. The collection that Ian has given us includes books in Albanian, Arabic, Basque, Bulgarian, Catalan, Chinese, Croatian, Czech, Danish, Dutch, Estonian, Finnish, French, Georgian, German, Greek, Hebrew, Hungarian, Icelandic, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Latvian, Lithuanian, Macedonian, Norwegian, <laughs> Polish, Portuguese, Romanian, Russian, Serbian, Slovak, Slovenian, Spanish, Swedish, Thai and Turkish. These books are being kept together here in the Bodleian Library, in fact, underneath where we're sitting, um, as a special collection of books, giving a unique view on the international literary production of uh, a major writer, but also celebration, celebrating the notion that ideas and culture themselves should not, and perhaps cannot, be confined to a single language or a single cultural context. The Bodleian has always been an institution that has valued this multilingual approach to the world. Within the first 10 years of the Bodleian opening, we had a books in our collection in every European language, um, at the time living or dead, as well as books in Hebrew, Arabic, Persian, Coptic, Slavonic, I could go through the alphabet, alphabet again, uh, and even Chinese and Japanese. And we were the first library outside of China to 
uh, hire and pay a Chinese librarian to come and catalogue the books that we had acquired. Uh, this was in the 1680s and we acquired our first Chinese books in 1604. Of course, the first thing that the Chinese cataloguer did was to turn the books the right way up on the shelves, but um, at least we were trying. Um, we even acquired a copy of the first book printed in Ukraine, which dates from 1574, and we have just recently digitised and will be launching online very shortly. And we acquired that book by the, middle of the se by the middle of the 17th century. So within the first 50 years or so of the library's existence. These things matter. We are fortunate to have Milton's annotated copy of uh, an Italian edition of Boccaccio. We even have Christopher Wren's copy of the first collected edition of Galileo's works. The idea that a great university can do its work solely in the vernacular has never been a valid one. And we hope that Oxford will continue to be a place that supports the study of languages, ancient and modern, and from across the globe, as an intellectually, culturally, and strategically essential undertaking. And of course, we're um, surrounded, fortunately, by scholars in this university who are utterly committed to that task. And indeed, to celebrate this extraordinary gift, this wonderful gift, and um, I'm just going to wave some more of them again in celebration. Um, we have brought together a, a distinguished panel of speakers, including Ian himself, but also two distinguished scholar translators from our own parish, so to speak. Firstly, allow me to welcome scholar and translator Professor Karen Leader, who is Professor of Modern German Literature and Fellow of New College here at the University of Oxford, and who is herself a distinguished translator of contemporary German literature, having won numerous awards for her translations, including the prestigious English Penn Award and American Penn Heim Award for her translation of Ulrika Almut Sandig's Thick of It, and the Frederick Nims Memorial Prize for translation for her translation of Dürr's Grünbein and an Austrian award, which she won for her translation of Evelyn Schlag's All Under One Roof and for services to, excuse me, to Austrian literature. She's joined by Professor Patrick McGuinness, Professor of French and Comparative Literature and Fellow of St Anne's College. Patrick has written scholarly work on the critic T.E. Hume. He has translated the poet St Stephen Mallarmé and edited the works of the symbolist writer Marcel Schwab and of the Argentinian Welsh writer Lynette Roberts. Patrick is also a creative writer and his first novel, The Last Hundred Days, was centred on the end of the Ceausescu regime in Romania and was nominated for the Booker Prize. And most recently, Other People's Countries won the Duff Cooper Prize. Patrick's poetry has also won him numerous accolades, his first volume being published in 2004 as The Canals of Mars. In 2012, the French nation presented him with the Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres. Karen and Patrick, as I said, are joined by Ian himself, and I'm now going to hand over to them. I think Ian um, is going to say a few words first then a discussion, and then we'll have a chance for some, uh, as they say, audience participation. Join me, please, in welcoming our distinguished panel. Well, thank you very much, Richard, uh, and thank you for taking this enormous pile of books off my hands. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, and especially grateful to have them in such a distinguished place. Uh, I feel a little uh, constrained uh, to be sitting by two distinguished scholars because the things I have to say about translation are largely anecdotal, mm -hmm. uh, except a, a passing reflection on uh, George Steiner's After Babel, uh, a, a book that uh, I recommend with a certain degree of uh, hesitation. Um, my very first book was a collection of stories, and its first appearance was in Dutch, uh, in a, an edition from a small publishing house, where I've stayed with them ever since, uh, in 1974 or 5, called De Harmony. Uh, and like a whole stretch of European publishers, 
the, there are these publishing houses that are just driven by one person. Uh, they often face, as in politics, a, a problem of succession. Uh, because they've built it up from almost nothing, uh, because their personalities are stamped across the whole house, uh, it's very awkward when they uh, die or retire uh, as to what happens next. Uh, De Harmony still retains its independence, still retains all the uh, characteristics of its publisher, Jakob Groot. Um, and so I was plunged at the age of 25 straight into the whole business of translation. I knew not a word of Dutch except those few words that, uh, well, quite a, few, a lot of words that coincide with German. And it was, for me, an exhilarating experience. So from the start, uh, the, the excitement of just being translated in the sense that bottom is, it really does, the word seemed to come, come to life. So uh, over a lifetime, I've kept up a close relationship with just a small handful, and they are the, the obvious ones. Interestingly, I think German was missing from your list. But anyway, I've stayed with the same publisher in Germany, but they're actually Swiss, I mean, in the German language. That's Diogenes, the same publisher in Italy, Einaudi, uh, and in France, too, with Gallimard. And the translators and the editors there have become all become close friends, and I've been very involved over the years with the business of those awkward, often just awkward words, awkward phrases. I have to also include in and, and in my foreign editions there are American editions, um, and I've had some rather wonderful uh, faux amis. Uh, in translating into American. <laughs> uh, for example, I have a scene where uh, children are overnighting uh, with some chums in a rather crowded household, and they are, to the horror of my American editor, who thought this was a bloody scene of child murder, they were topped and tailed. <laughs> um, and uh, Maybe you don't know this phrase in English. Is it still used? <laughs> Rooms are larger now. Uh, anyway, one child s sleeps with the feet of the other child on the same pillow. Uh, and also, in many, many guests in the United States uh, on entering a household are asked if they would like to wash up. Uh, it always <laughs> seems a little premature. Anyway, as I think Churchill famously said, you know, these languages are so close that... Uh, misunderstandings are right. I don't know if you know George Steiner's book, After Babel. It's, uh, I, I had to go and buy another one because I thought I had it for years. It just had not survived a couple of house moves. Uh, and in it, Steiner wants to make the point that all literature is translation, that moving from experience to language is a form of translation. Uh, and he talks quite at length actually about children's language and children's verse and how that is a translation, as it were, uh, that adults have to make in, in, into their own universe. <clears throat> it's a sparkling book, like much of Steiner. Uh, you will come away with a deep inferiority complex because on every page there are 25 books he's read or says he's read uh, and you, not, you have not even heard of. Uh, and, and I would say that uh, yes, this is an interesting, vital point, but it sort of means that translation becomes everything and therefore nothing. Uh, we're talking about the very specific matter of literary translation. Um, we bring to translation minds that are already shaped by translation. I'm sorry to make this obvious recursive point, but from the Bible onwards and the way that it is fed into our own literature, and into other literatures, and then assuming that you don't read Spanish for Cervantes or German for Thomas Mann or, or whatever it is, um, I would calculate my own experience somewhere between a quarter and a third of all the books I've ever read have been in translation. And therefore, 
my mental furniture has already been shaped by translation uh, and informs my view of it. I have one or two writer friends who have said to me that books in translation are not really the book and not worth having. And there's an even more absolutist view on this, which I've heard. Uh, that there are certain words and certain concepts that cannot be translated, that cannot move from one context to another. Now, there may be some truth to this, but I think that language has evolved to discuss and share experience, either one's own or other people's. And so I think the art and gift of, of, of great translators is to get round this. There's no biological impossibility about translating anything. And to give you an example of this, I would reverse engineer this. Suppose we took, as Douglas Adams and John Lloyd did some years ago in the book of Liff, suppose we took an arbitrary number of towns and then just ascribed meanings to them. Now, two that have stayed with me ever since Douglas Adams and John Lloyd produced this book was um, Abilene, a town in Kansas. Um, now, an Abilene, by their definition, was on a hot, restless night. It's the cool part of the pillow <laughs> that one seeks out. Now, imagine that Abilene was a word in Tagalog or Dutch or any other language. It seems to me you're describing your character's hot, restless night, and she finds on the pillow that Abilene. We don't have that word, we don't have that, but we, we make that concept. How to move this word across into English and still build a succinct sentence without having a footnote or a lengthy definition would seem to me one of the arts of translation. Let me tell you another word. Maybe you know it. Peoria. Anyone know what a peoria is? It's the growing anxiety while cooking that you haven't made enough roast potatoes. <laughs> um, my grown-up sons and myself are very competitive about who makes the best roast potatoes, and Peoria has, well, it's taken me a lifetime of cooking to realize that as you cook roast potatoes, they shrink uh, because the moisture goes out of them. And sure enough, that pan that was stacked full of them at the beginning, suddenly you've got seven people coming to dinner. There's only going to be three each, uh, and they're all rather small. So I would make the same point that the art of translation would be to somehow convey that anxiety without interrupting the flow of a sentence. Um, I've just finished a book just in, in lots of conversation with, with my translators. At the end of um, my novel called Lessons, um, it, its central figure is sitting with his granddaughter and they're having a conversation in German. And I decided on the, on the format of putting her sentence um, not in italics, keeping them in Roman, and then out of inverted in, in speech commas, <laughs> putting a translation. Anyway, she says, uh, she's talking about a book by Tommy Ungerer, uh, a wonderful artist, um, great artist in my view, a genius, uh, who wrote a children's book called Flix. And Flix is a dog who is born to, uh, he has cat parents. It turns out that uh, an ancestor um, of his, a poodle, uh, had an affair with a cat. And the genes have resurfaced. Anyway, Flix grows up with cat parents, but he's a dog. And the little girl says, Opa, er muss gebratene Maus essen. <laughs> Granddad, he has to eat fried mice. Um, the translator wrote to me and said, and you probably, you probably all know this, but when a human eats, it's Essen. When a dog eats or an animal, it's Fressen. So should she say, er muss gebraten, the mouse Fressen? Mm -hmm. Well, the dog is fully clothed. 
<laughs> the dog marries a cat, uh, and they get married in a church. Um, he goes fishing. Uh, he um, later in life becomes a, a rights campaigner for equal treatment of cats and dogs. So it's, it's, a, it's a moral story, <laughs> uh, but told very wryly in, in, in uh, Tommy Ingram's style. Should Flix fressen or essen? And I said, well, I, I said, I'll write to Daniel Kaelman. Uh, and uh, a very well-known German novelist, if you don't know who that is, you should by now. Uh, Daniel said, S has to be Essen. Because actually, in children's stories, animals are actually really people. Mm. So, uh, but anyway, I conveyed this to the translator, and he agreed. But he said, I just love this exchange. He said. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, in that moment, uh, I felt all the joy of having worked with the same translator for you know, almost 40 years. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Um, well, um, follow that. Um, I, um, I wanted to talk about this idea of the gift of translation in a couple of different ways. Um, uh, first of all, the, I, I think uh, when I started translating um, about 30 years ago, um, I think it might have been, one might have been forgiven for thinking it was also the burden of translation. There was a sense that uh, translation was not... Uh, a, a very popular mode in this country. Very few books were translated. It was between 2 and 4% of the total book market at the time. Um, because, of course, I mean, there are reasons that um, English is such a rich uh, and multivalent language, and there are so many Englishes, the argument was, why do we need all these other languages as well? Um, now, that, that um, scene has changed substantially, I think, um, and for the better. And even in the last five years or so, the visibility of the translator has become so much greater. Um, I'm thinking recently of the campaign by Mark Haddon and Jennifer Croft, for example, to have the translator's name on the cover of the book, um, which uh, a few years ago very often didn't happen. Um, but to acknowledge it as a, as a creative act, uh, an independent creative act. Um, that visibility has brought more questions, of course, also. Um, uh, political questions, too. Um, and you might remember the, um, the debates about Amanda Gorman's The Hill We Climb. I don't know whether people followed this. When it was to be translated into various different languages. Um, very uh, visceral debates, I have to say, about who had the right to translate um, and take and create the voice of Gorman in other languages. Um, quite frankly, did that have, could that be a white man, for example, as an extreme question? So very many interesting uh, debates, which I think are important to have, um, which all indicate that translation has now a political edge, which it didn't have um, not very long ago. Um, and also, I think, an acknowledgement that there are critical moments in translation in which, um, in, in, in the body of English literature, English language literature, when translation has been very important. One can think about, for example, the 1960s when the great Eastern European poets were translated for the first time, and Ted Hughes, of course, was uh, you know, very active in that and a fundamental mediator of that body of poetry, um, which changed the way people could write in English. Um, or uh, there's a very nice example of when, uh, which might be less obvious, but is equally powerful, I think, of Bob Dylan going to a theatre, a downtown theatre, and hearing Brecht's The Pirate Jenny for the first time. And in his chronicles, he talks about how it was like a blow in the stomach, and he couldn't eat or sleep for 30 hours until he'd unpacked this Brecht poem, understood exactly how it worked, and that allowed him to write many of his most fav uh, famous songs. Um, so there are these moments, I think, when translations come into a language and change it. Um, but also, more generally, they helpfully destabilize a canon, hierarchies, introduce new ideas, new voices, uh, and a part of a kind of evolution. 
There are downsides, which I'll talk about perhaps later, but I wanted to talk about gift also in a second way. Is translation a gift or can you teach it? Uh, now, I'd have a vested interest in the answer yeah. to that question as I teach it uh, very, very regularly and I, I think I've spotted a student or two um, <coughs> who've suffered that. Um, of course, the prominence of translation in the academy has been one of the reasons it has also gained in political clout in the last decade or so, the rise of translation as part of creative writing. Um, and with it, translation theory. Um, so there's a huge body of literature about uh, how to translate, uh, theoretical literature about how to translate, although, ironically, get translation theorists and, translate, and translators in a room together, and they really cannot talk to each other at all. Um, but also the rise recently, I think, of a kind of interesting hybrid, um, translators writing about the experience of translation. And I'm thinking about a book like uh, Kate Briggs' this, this Little Art, which become bestsellers in, in themselves, and talk about the kind of process of translation, but also the translator's life that goes into the work of translation um, as well, and have become something uh, of a genre uh, in and of themselves. Um, I think um, that that academic translation we can perhaps talk about um, whether whether it's possible to teach. Um, it's certainly possible to teach um, strategies uh, for doing that, um, but it perhaps comes down to this question of whether this is a, a practice or an art, which is one of the big questions um, that, that uh, uh, kind of circle in um, such uh, debates. Um, and also, I think one of the interesting things in that regard is the sort of academic study of translation. So, for example, recently I've written about translations of Shakespeare's sonnets into German and traced the extraordinary way they changed um, over the centuries um, and changed the national literature, German national literature, but also then changed the way we can view Shakespeare the original. So translation can have a very powerful, offer a very powerful vision of an original too. For example, in the 80s, everybody was translating Shakespeare as a, a sort of gender-bending, very trendy performance uh, poet. Um, but now it's in the 2000s, Shakespeare became about gene manipulation. So you can see the idea of the just sort of genetic inheritance in Shakespeare suddenly becoming very of the moment. I'm thinking of someone like Ulrike Dresner there, for example. Um, so this sense that translation can change a national literature, but also then offer insights into the original, which seem, it seems equally important um, to me. Um, I wanted to perhaps talk then lastly and more personally um, about how do you do it, or what is my experience as a, as a translator? And I was struck by Ian saying it inevitably comes about anecdotes. And I think it's inevitable that every translation is different, as every work of uh, creative literature is different, and the personal relationships involved in it are different, as well as the political and uh, professional relationships. Um, they're always sort of one-offs. But I suppose um, what it seems to me is important, in a sense, is starting from that idea that all language is translation, um, which I thoroughly believe in. One finds strategies. Um, Holdelin talked about translation being as to find the, the foreign and analogous. So you're shifting something across, but you have to find a mode that is at once foreign at home in a foreign place, but also has a strong enough link uh, to the original, which makes of translation of, uh, simultaneously a very humble undertaking, but also a supremely arrogant <laughs> undertaking, um, in that you think you can do that. You think you can find the spirit of a work um, and fetch it over into a foreign material, but where that spirit is still, um, is still viable, is still visible, can still um, sing. Um, following on from what Ian said about the untranslatability of things, I think I would say that every time I start a new work, um, I mostly work on poetry, I should say, but if we've been just talking about this, I've also ventured into novels, and there'll be different things to say about that. Every time I translate a work, I look at it and think, 
I can't do that, that's untranslatable, some aspect of it is untranslatable. And then often it takes six months before my own language has stretched to accommodate the foreign and it becomes translatable. Now, quite often one doesn't have time for such luxuries as six months, but then I'm an academic, not a tra somebody who lives from translation, which is an important point. But what interests me there is the idea of the translation creating pathways in the brain, not only in a culture, but in the brain too. Um, uh, Don Patterson talked about uh, translating Rilke um, and how reading Rilke for a long time created new possibilities of thinking and new possibilities of saying, like watercourses, that when he'd finished translating Rilke, um, were still there. And the book after his Rilke translations was a book of sonnets, and I thought, aha, that's Rilke. Um, so this idea of your brain changing um, through the, the activity um, of translating. But also, of course, it's a work of uh, lexical work, understanding the meaning of words, um, like Abilene and <laughs> Peoria, um, in their individual um, contexts, and uh, I've learned about so many areas of life through translating that I never would have known about. Um, most recently in, in a book of lectures by Doris Grunbein, I know everything there is to know about German motorway construction in the 1930s, <laughs> down to all the different words for the different kinds of grit and the tamping, and it's just such a rich and amazing uh, field of knowledge that <laughs> I will probably forget again by next week, um, but it's there for the moment. But you also, so there's that lexical work, there's that research work, but there's also the, the kind of hundred micro, micro decisions that you make as a translator um, at the coalface. Um, and that becomes aware, you become aware of that, I think, particularly when you end up doing interlinear translations or literal translations for other people. Um, I quite recently mediated um, uh, between two poets, uh, the uh, Anglo-Indian poet Tishani Doshi and Ulrika Almut Sandi, the German, in creating a, a poem and, and, and joint poems together and done literals for each of them. Um, but also, not very long ago, between Doris Grumman and the late Matthew Sweeney, which was a wonderful um, uh, experience, quite frustrating as well. But when I looked at the literals of Doris Grumman that I'd done for Matthew Sweeney, there were about six pages of details about what words mean, what they refer to, what the rhythms are, what it sounds like, um, what kind of hidden references there might be, how this fits with uh, X, Y, and Z. And all that happens, I think, in a kind of micro decision as you're translating. But it was only setting it out like that that made me, that made me realize exactly how much it is. Um, so I think I would sort of come to a close there and, and, and perhaps uh, pass on to, um, to Patrick um, to, to sort of think about, uh, to talk about his work as both a writer uh, and translator. Um, but I have to say that, that I, have, I find it one of the most rewarding things that I do. I uh, would very much like to make it much more a part of this university's business um, at a formal level. Um, but also it is, I think, and this is one of the big debates about translation at the moment, I think it is different from creative writing. And I've thought about this a lot um, in that when you're writing, it seems to me, um, you kind of cast a lasso out and you don't know where. You don't know what's going to be found there. You don't know where it's going. But when you're translating, you always have a goal. You know where it has to end. And that seems to me a very fundamental difference. It's a kind of scary journey very often, but there is always a destination. Um, whether you reach it or not is another question, but it's fun, the journey. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> as Karen indicated, those of us who are academics as part of our day job also teach translation to students who don't always want to do it. <laughs> they don't always feel that it's a gift, or at least it's not something we're giving them in the sense of a present or a uh, gift, because for them it's something they stress about. Um, we spoil translation by making it an exam. And um, one of the things I try to do in order to bring it alive to my students is to tell them that what they are engaged in when they're sitting in my room for an hour every week translating from French into English, what they're doing is in fact contributing to some, some extraordinary way in which cultures speak to each other. And 
without wanting to get too highfalutin, because otherwise they would laugh at me, um, I try to remind them that they're engaged in perhaps the first primary mode of communication between different kinds of people. And I, I do that because I remember that when I was their age, during my year abroad, which I unwisely spent in Ceausescu's Romania, um, and which did in the end give me something to write about, but though at quite some cost, I used to go to the British Council Library in the days when the British Council itself a form of translation, that is to say, and I'm sure Ian's been on many British Council events in the days when their job was, in a sense, to mediate, to translate both ways from other cultures into Britain's cultural world and then back out again. Um, I used to go to the British Council Library and read the poets in, strangely enough, I was, my memory, Modern Poetry in Translation, um, which was, as Karen indicated, edited by Daniel Weisbord and Ted Hughes. In the late 80s, when I was having my year out, I used to go and read the East European poets of the country that I was living in, but had never met and couldn't meet because they weren't allowed to circulate among foreigners and so on. And I remember opening um, Modern Poetry and Translation and reading the Romanian poet Marin Sorescu, who I knew about and had heard about, but had never seen. I, I probably could have lived 20 minutes away from him or something. And some strange out-of-body experience that has stayed with me since then of translation being, as I said, the, the way cultures speak to each other through people, not through politicians, not through banks, not through adverts, um, through people. And, and often in these skittering, accidental, aleatory ways. Now, I don't bore my students with that in every translation class, but I try to tell them that what they're doing really is um, engaging in an act of communication. I try to make the texts interesting enough also to discuss. And I also find that very often I'm describing translation and inviting them to tra describe translation in metaphorical terms. Translation is a strange art because it's very hard to say exactly what it is. Um, and that's why, incidentally, as Karen indicated, theories of translations don't really help, do they, when you're translating. Um, you can go to a whole seminar, a whole two-day conference on translation theory, and you think, well, that's going to help me translate this uh, page of uh, Malarmé, and you sit down, it doesn't help at all. In the end, it's a strangely intimate experience. It's you and the words and nothing else. However, you still need to know something, and part of what we try to educate students into realizing is just how much knowledge they have to have before they can get past knowledge and not worry about what they know. And I think that's the way I would try to teach translation and encourage people to practice it. And as someone who writes myself and is occasionally translated, I, I know how much the world depends on translation. Um, and as I said earlier, um, the the way in which we describe translation always seems to be kind of hedged about with, with metaphors. Why? Because I think translation is a process as well as an art, and it's a process by which something becomes something else while remaining <laughs> what it was before. Um, Karen has said the same things more articulately. Um, it's a very unusual kind of alchemy, uh, stroke recycling, depending on whether you're thinking upwards or downwards or sideways, which is recycling, because that too is noble. Um, recycling, which incidentally is a good example of a metaphor that 20 or 30 years ago was rather humdrum and now contains a sort of planet-saving imperative. Check the way in, in which recycling has been used as a verb over the last 30 or 40 years, and you basically have a cultural history of how we think about our planet. That's a very bold thing to say. I'm not sure it's true, but it suddenly seemed, <laughs> suddenly seemed like the right thing to say on this occasion, changing in order to remain the same. Um, the metaphor that I first used for translation with my children was, in fact, the bureau de charge, which actually is a terrible metaphor because there's always a commission. But I like the idea of the commission as if there was a little extra piece of the original um, 
that was being kept back somehow. And I love translations that communicate something to me, that give me a sense of fresh contact with another culture, while also reminding me that it isn't all there, that something has been kept back, that I don't own this, that my anglospherical privilege hasn't allowed me to go into every possible nook and cranny of it. So maybe the bureau de change is not such a bad uh, metaphor after all. But it is interesting that translation as an art, as, a, as an act, as a kind of cultural intervention, and the translator is a figure as well, this kind of ghostly figure moving through the centuries, moving across the cultures as a bridge, but sometimes also a block. Um, the translator can also prevent through censorship. You know, Ian was talking earlier about particular kinds of censorship that were preventing um, translations of his work. So the trans translator's got a lot of this anonymous power as well, which perhaps we can think about. Um, I'm now going to lower the tone, but I'm, the last thing I'm going to say is, um, and, and this is in keeping with the potatoes um, that Ian uh, mentioned, evoked earlier. When I, I, I wrote a memoir about, called Other People's Countries, which, which is about the movement from my childhood in uh, industrial Belgium to England, where I was sent to school. And um, we spoke French at home. My father, who was a, a, a Newcastle, uh, came from Newcastle, from Irish stock, he had a favorite phrase in English, which was pissing in your chips. Now, that means, of course, ruining something for yourself, you know. Um, and, but he never, because we spoke French at home in this small Belgian town, he would always say it in French, pisser dans ses frites. And when, when we first heard it, my sister and I, we thought it was a Belgian phrase, because in Belgium, chips are very important, and you don't go around pissing in them. So, so not, not only was he transliterating this idiom, which back where he lived was um, very, very common. In Liverpool, I've heard it with the chips replaced by strawberries, but you get the idea. Um, and so I always heard pisser dans ses frites. I knew what it meant, but I never had access to the original um, iteration um, of the phrase. And many years later, when I wrote this memoir, I wrote a little chapter about that strange moment when I discovered using the phrase in French in a neighboring town, everyone looked at me, <laughs> and I thought it was an idiom. I felt very at home with it. In fact, it was just a strange little um, cutting um, that had been propagated in our small industrial town to the extent that everyone in the family used the phrase but no one outside it. When the book was being translated into Spanish, the guy said to me, Jorge, said to me, look, we can't have chips here because chips don't have the same cultural function. And it went on and on like that. So that's a rather lower kind of example of cultural translatability. Um, and I, I actually managed to persuade him to keep chips rather than patatas bravas or something like that. <laughs> um, but in order to keep the potato theme, he would have had to forge a new idiom, which might have been very good too, and it might have caught on, and who knows. So it's the catching on, it's the propagated branch line that I like, the way translation doesn't follow the usual paths somehow. It escapes all the linearities that are imposed upon us. And, and I like that, and I, I treasure it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, as I was cycling into Oxford this morning down the Woodstock Road, I saw a, a big hot air balloon, and I thought, how nice of Virgin to, uh, announce, uh, to sort of advertise this evening's session. Um, but we've, uh, we're so grateful to um, Karen and Patrick for joining Ian this evening in this very rich discussion about uh, both the craft of translation but also uh, its incredible rich variety and how it enables us to have a, a contact, a dialogue between cultures, but also in the way that uh, the work of a great author can be 
um, communicated across not just um, large, if you like, publishing worlds, but small, smaller language groups, smaller countries with their own languages. And I think the role of uh, publishers and their agents in being able to communicate those ideas across um, across the globe is is so important in a world where we are divided increasingly by uh, geopolitical events, so things which unite us and bring us together and allow that communication and dialogue to foster and flourish are ever more important, it seems to me. Um, I just have one final thing before I'm going to ask you to come and have a drink with us, and that is to present a very small gift to Ian, which is, um, he's already received our highest honour, which is the Bodley Medal, but we have, uh, a, a few years ago, we made a facsimile of a little thing, a patch box, that is in our archive of Percy Bysshe Shelley. And... Um, we don't quite know how it came to be in his collection, but we made a facsimile of it, and it simply says on it, liberty and free election. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a very small um, token to say thank you, Ian, for your, for your wonderful gift. So one, uh, Oxford writer's um, legacy in this library, and Ian's is perhaps the, the latest in that, in that tradition. Thank you very much, Bridget. I'll keep my snuff in here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. But please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking Patrick, Aaron, and Mr. <laughs>